Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Angelic Conflict class. This is a class that's put on by the Everett Grace Fellowship Church in Everett, Washington. We anticipate that we will be moving back into the Labor Temple to have face-to-face -face classes there, at least the Sunday ones. And uh, I anticipate that this would be on the very first Sunday of May. We would ask for your prayers that we would be able to make this a successful transition as uh, there are some uh, latent complications that surround the event. Well, once again, I welcome you to our Angelic Conflict class. And as is our custom, let's take a few moments for silent prayer so that we can make ourselves eligible to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in teaching us and bringing to our mind, our remembrance, everything that uh, the Lord Jesus taught. So if uh, there are no more prayers for you to, uh, or sins for you to confess, then I would ask that you would remember me in prayer that I would be able to bring to you the message clearly, concisely, and uh, convincingly. So let's take a few moments for silent prayer, and I will close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have allotted to us another moment in time to take a segment of this day so that we can dedicate our minds, our hearts, to look at your word and thus to gain an advantage. We ask that the Holy Spirit might be our instructor and that we might learn these particular points which will be before us. We pray that you would facilitate not only our learning, but our being in front of your word. We pray, Father, for those who are believers in Christ. We ask that you might invigorate their souls. We ask, Father, for those who are not believers in Christ, that the Holy Spirit might use this particular message to stimulate their thinking about trusting Christ as their only Savior. And so, Father, having said these particular requests, we thank you once again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, folks. When we begin with the Angelic Conflict class, we always like to go through the 14th and 15th verses of Genesis chapter 3 because that reminds us of the fact that the Lord has already won the victory in this so-called conflict. And so let me rehearse those two verses uh, as they are given to us in the New American Standard Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And remembering that this is an address to the serpent. This is not an address to you and to me. It's an address to the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Well, this is what our outline looks like at this point so that we know where we are in our study. This is capital letter F, victory on the angelic front, and the tactical victory, which is actually brought about by the church. The strategic victory is brought about by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and that's when he broke the back or crushed the head of Satan. And now we have the tactical victory, and this is the mop-up operation that the church age does um, during the ages or the years of the church age. So far, we have two 
major points under the tactical victory. And first of all, we have a working definition of a tactical victory. And then we have an operation briefing. Operation briefing has seven points, and we are on point number five, strategy of Satan. Point number five, strategy of Satan. You should see it flagellating on your screen. The strategy of Satan, capital or letter A in the unmatched parentheses, and that is that religion is part of satanic's, satanic strategy. Please bear in mind that organized religion is satanic. It doesn't seem like it is. It won't appear to you like it is. It will not be presented to you like it is. But rest assured, it is part of Satan's strategy. Letter B. Satan's counterfeits of the plan of God in religion include a counterfeit gospel, counterfeit ministers, counterfeit doctrine, counterfeit righteousness, that is a way of life which seems right unto man. And now number five, where we are in our study, a counterfeit communion table, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21. Actually, we need to look at the whole chapter. This is what is commonly referred to in exegesis as a pericope. And a pericope means that this is a reference to an Old Testament event that teaches people in the church age certain principles. And in this particular case, that is, in the case of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the principle is get away from idolatry, or as it says, flee idolatry. Get away from it. Step away from the car. That's what the cops say to somebody who is uh, a suspicious person. And let's put it this way. Step away from idolatry. Let it not have a part in your life. This way you are separated and separated to do something other than to be idolatrous. So number five is counterfeit communion table. As you can see, there are still six, seven, and eight, and we will look at each of those in the near future. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to read verses 14 through 22. There are actually something like 30 verses or 31 verses in this chapter, but uh, we only want to read these verses. And that is because they are the ones that are most focused. In other words, this is where the funnel of this chapter all pours uh, its focus and its pressure. Verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices shares in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We're not stronger than he, are we? Thus ends the reading of God's word, and may he bless this to our understanding. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight for you so that you will understand where it is that we are going in this passage of Scripture. If you will look kindly at the at the screen, you will notice that I have just highlighted a portion of of verse 16 is not the cup of blessing which we bless 
you can see that I just highlighted the cup of blessing which we bless. What is that precisely? That is what we're going to see today. And then we want to take a look not only at the main idea that the Apostle Paul wants to uh, impress upon his readers, and let me highlight that with my uh, cursor. Beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from... Notice that it doesn't say, you know, you can get away from idolatry a little bit at a time. You can dissimulate. You can dissolve away from idolatry. It says flee from idolatry. And if I may be so rude and crude and insulting to my categorical colleagues, pastors of categorical churches, those who study very carefully, I'm going to use the word repent. And in this particular case, the word repent, applying it to idolatry. Why? Because idolatry is when a person depends upon some idol, whatever that may be, for salvation or for well-being as far as life is concerned. And this verse, verse 14, says, get away from, run away from idolatry. If you are not a believer in Christ, you cannot believe in an idol and believe in Christ. This is why we say faith alone in Christ alone. It's not Christ plus something else. And you would say, well, I, I, I'm not really believing in two things. I'm only believing in Christ, but I'm adding something just in case Christ doesn't work. And what I'll say to you there is, whoa, because you are dead wrong. It must be faith alone, nothing else but faith, no works, no hope sows, in Christ alone, only in Christ, not Christ and Buddha, Christ and Mohammed, Christ and my something else, faith alone and Christ alone. So, verse 16 says, is not the cup of blessing which we bless. What does he mean by that and how does it relate to idolatry? That is what we're going to come to. The next thing I want to call your attention is found in verse 21. You cannot, notice that it says there, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Notice that it doesn't even say you don't. It says you cannot. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. This word cannot is the cannot of prohibition. It is not a cannot of description. It is the cannot of prohibition. In other words, it is prohibited for you to partake of the Lord's table, that's communion, and of the cup of demons. That's communion at the demon communion table. When we meet for the first time, uh, once again at the Labor Temple, we will be observing communion. And I will be giving you a special message on communion. And some of it is going to uh, interrelate with this. It is going to become a braided rope that will bring your thinking to a different point as far as how you feel and what you will pine about the communion table. Okay, let's move on. Letter A, the cup of blessing is a reference to the third cup of the Passover, that is the Seder Supper. The last time that we were together, I had a typo on the screen, and that is why I'm taking a little extra time to emphasize and re-emphasize to highlight that we are talking about the third cup, the third cup of the Passover supper. So, there are four courses 
in the supper. It's just like when you go to a fancy restaurant, you know, they will serve you an appetizer, then a salad, maybe a soup, and then you have the main entree. And then after that, you may have a dessert or you may have a dessert wine or something like that. The Passover supper has four, and each one of these is delineated by a cup of wine by a cup of wine. Now, that in itself can be controversial because the Passover is supposed to be observed with zero yeast. That means zero fermentation. But here we have wine. So, what is it that we're supposed to do with this? Well, what we're supposed to do is just set that controversy over to the side and just take the verses that we are going to be looking at at face value. The cup of blessing is a reference to the third cup of wine in the Passover supper. Modern Jews refer to it as the seder, chaseder. The four cups of wine used in the seder symbolize four distinct promises made by God, as are recorded in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. So let me put these verses up there on the uh, screen. You will find them on that white block, which is in the lower center part of your screen. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, this is God speaking to Moses, so that Moses could convey this to the people of Israel. Quote, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. So, let's look at these four distinct promises that are made. The first of these, or every one of them, is introduced or prefaced with the word, I will. The words, I will. When you have the words, I will, it means that God is uncompromisingly going to initiate, facilitate, and consummate each one of these actions. They are not going to be a coordinated effort. They are going to be done by God and by God alone. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. First one. I will deliver you from their bondage. That's the second one. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and a great judgments. All God. Then I will take you for my people. And, you, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. So, here we have our promises, and here's the first one. Bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Deliver you from their bondage. The third one, I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. What are those judgments? They were the ten plagues of Egypt. Then I will take you for my people. And this is when they stood in front of Mount Sinai. And God brought them not only the Decalogue, but he also brought them a covenant in which they would become their God's client nation, that is, his covenant people. As a covenant people, it means that God is making a unilateral promise to them. And that unilateral promise will be fulfilled way into the future in what we call the Millennium that graduates into eternity. I, I will take you for my people, 
and I will be your God. There are four cups in this Passover supper. There's sanctification, cup number one. There's deliverance, cup number two. Redemption, cup number three. And restoration, cup number four. These four cups are the cup of sanctification. The second one is the cup of deliverance. The third one is the cup of redemption. Cup number three. And cup number four, the cup of restoration. Now, let me ask you if you recall what it is that I said a little earlier. Which is the cup that we're going to be centering our attention on? It is the cup number three. Cup number three. The cup of redemption. Why? Because this also carries the name, the cup of blessing, which we bless. And I am also going to show you how part of what happens under cup number two and cup number three get rolled into a different supper altogether that we call the Lord's Supper. But let's get to something else first. The first cup. Okay, we've taken a look at the uh, four cups. Now let's take a look at the first cup. What in, is involved in the first cup? Well, when you have the Passover supper, the head of the family, this is usually the father, the grandfather, it's the oldest male in the family. He is the one who is in charge. God has put the father to be the head of the family. This is never to be done. Let me repeat, never to be done by a woman. The head of the family, the man, is going to take the first cup of wine in his hand and then he's going to offer a prayer of thanks. And he will start his prayer by beginning with these words. The prayer is long and so I've only quoted the first line. Blessed art thou, Jehovah our God, who has created the fruit of the vine. Why? Because he's holding a cup of wine in his hand. At this point, everyone washes their hands. It's a ceremonial washing. And if you look into the Gospels, you'll find that there were two particular traditions. And it was an argument as to whether you should wash your hands and go up, up like this, or dip your hands and just drip them like that. It was, there was a controversy. We're not going into that. But everybody at the table washes their hands in a ceremonial way. At this time, in the New Testament, is when our Lord washed the disciples' feet. John 13 and verse 5. The supper table, or the supper having been served, he puts on a towel and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. So would you please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, and we will take a look at this particular scene. And so let me begin to read at verse 1. Remember the verse that we want is verse 5, but I'll, I'll begin to read at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 1 is a wonderfully intimate verse. First and foremost, you have to know that the Lord Jesus did not walk into the Last Supper blind. He knew what was going to happen. It says, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, he knew that he was going to depart out of this world and go to the Father. Now, I want you to highlight that in your mind, that the Son is going to the Father, because I want you to hold that particular 
fact in your mind so that when we are studying Romans chapter 8 and we look at the doctrine of paterology, this is going to ring ever more true. Verse 2, during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simeon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God, and he was going back to God, got up from the supper. Please notice that. Got up from the supper. Now see, let me go back to uh, uh, 13.2. During supper, that doesn't really mean during supper. It means now that the table was set and the dishes were on there and there were certain things put on the dishes. The table was served. But before anybody would do any eating or anything, there had to be the offering of this cup and the washing of hands. And that is what is being said here. Jesus, knowing that all of these things and that he was going back to God, verse 4, got up from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. You see, this was actually part of the first cup. This is part of the ceremony that takes place at the first cup. So verse 5 tells us that he uh, poured water and began to wash the feet of the disciples. So he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And I want to emphasize this. If you are not washed by the Savior, you are not saved. Is that clear? You can only be saved by Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to our next point. Point to prime. In washing their hands, and this is at the table, this customary prayer was repeated. Here it comes. Blessed art thou, Jehovah our God, who has sanctified us with thy commandments and has enjoined us concerning the washing of our hands. And so the next thing that was done after the washing of hands the, another prayer was offered. And I, I know that I am saying the word prayer. And I know that when you look at the scriptures, you will notice that prayer is used time and again. But let me emphasize this. And that is that this is a table where, shall we say, two people are communing with one another. And so prayer is the way in which one person talks to the other person. And so if Jesus is our icon, in other words, if he is taking our place and he is talking to the Father, then he's making this prayer. If the head of the table is the type of the Lord Jesus, then he is talking to God. So it's a communication. It is a conversation. And so, blessed art thou, Jehovah our God. Okay, that was the first cup, or that was the four cups, the first cup. Now let's take a look at the second cup. The second cup, and let's begin with A prime. The Torah directed that at the Passover supper, the father was to show his son 
the importance of this celebration. This duty was carried out by having the youngest son make the inquiry, and here it is. Why is this night different from all other nights? This is, shall I say, one of the oldest questions in the history of mankind, because it is part of the oldest celebration in the history of mankind. Why is this night different from all other nights? God implanted this question, this inquiry, so that you men who are heads of your families would teach your sons, that is, those that follow in your generation, what the meaning of your relationship to God is. And you have this particular celebration year after year after year. And so if you have five sons, all five of them are going to ask this question. Because if it doesn't hit, hit them the first year, it's going to hit them the second, the third, or the fourth, or the fifth. Because they will be the youngest male uh, in the family, and they will ask the question. And they are going to ask the question, and everybody at the table is going to listen to you explain why this night is different. The father would then answer by quoting and explaining Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 11. Would you please turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 26. Beginning at verse 5, this is the way that the father then answers. And he answers by quoting these particular verses. Notice what it says. You shall answer and say before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean. Now let me stop here for a minute. Notice that, first of all, in the context, it's supposed to be the priest. But in future um, Passovers, it becomes the head of the family. And the head of the family says, my father was a wandering Aramean. It doesn't say our father Abraham. My father. Why? Because this is a personal relationship that goes from generation to generation to generation. And fathers, parents, this means that it is God's will for you to poke into the privacy of your next generation and see that they recognize the value of faith in Christ so that they might make that decision year after year. And if you have them in your home for just 18 years, they will hear your explanation 18 times. Now, how thick is the skull of your son that he won't get this message? If after 18 times he still rejects Christ, you have done your job. A Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down to Egypt and sojourned there. Few a number. And there he became a great, mighty, and populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And this is the way it goes. Verse 8. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror, with great signs and wonders. And he has brought us to this place and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, 
I have brought the first of the produce of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. Notice in verse 10 that there is a second act of worship that is mentioned here, and that is that of supporting, shall I say, the religion. The bringing forth of the tithes. In the church age, we don't have a tithe. We don't have a tax. The principle is still there, however. And I know that to many of you, it's I'm just preaching to the choir. You already know this principle. But there are some of you out there who are listening to me or who will listen to me in years after. And you need to know that your talent your time and your treasure belong to the Lord and you should take your treasure so that this particular spiritual organism was able to continue on as an organization on the face of this earth. Verse 11, And you and the Levite and the alien who is among you you shall rejoice in all the good which the Lord your God has given you and your household. Notice that there is a command there to rejoice. And the idea is that you're supposed to take inventory of the blessings that God has given you and rejoice in them. Letter C, or C prime, the head of the family now took up the dish with the Passover lamb, the one that, and the one that had the bitter herbs and the one that had the unleavened bread, and he briefly explained the symbolism of each one of these items. Now, sometimes the dish might have all three items on it, depending on the size of the family. And at other times, there might be three dishes. And it's the father's job to go through each one of these and to explain what each one of these mean. And so I am going to go through these so that you uh, will get at least an outline form of what they mean. In Exodus 13.8, we have the textual foundation for celebrating the, the Passover supper with joy. He brought us forth from the bondage of freedom, from sorrow into joy, from mourning to a festival, from darkness to a great light, from slavery to redemption. Therefore, let us sing before him. And the singing is hallelujah. And you know what they would sing? They would sing Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. So just so that we have an idea as to what they sang, would you please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. But first, let's take a look at the short Psalm, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. That's hallelujah. Here is a beautiful word that the world has now taken and has tried to pervert it. But here is a word that is spoken throughout the whole world. Almost every single language uses this word, and they use it in exactly the same way. It is an exclamation of joy. Hallelujah. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Isn't that a beautiful verse? From the rising of the sun to its setting. Wonderful. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises the poor from the dust 
and lifts the needy from the dunghill to make him sit with princess and with princess of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as the joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. Next ver next Psalm, Psalm 114. When Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from the house of strange language, Judah, be Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee, O Jordan? that you turn back, O Jordan, O mountains, that you skip like rams, O hills like lambs. Tremble, O earth, before the Lord, before the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of water. These are great eulogies, but they're more than eulogies. They are invocations. They are the invitation for you to praise the Lord for what it is that he has done. So, as the head of the house, in the second cup, the father would say, let us sing before him. And this singing was done. Now, it's true that in modern days, they have a little booklet that everybody in the table has. It's kind of like a hymn book so that people can read the words. But you know, in the ancient days, they knew it by heart. And when you know it by heart, it's in here and it is in here for years and years and years. You want your children to grow up with the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Teach them to memorize the scriptures. Don't let their brains be lazy. Spark them. The next stage of the supper was the eating stage. Okay, up until now, we've had the raising of the cups, the washing of the hands. And so uh, they have the expl explanation of the uh, different food that's in the dishes. The next stage of the supper was the eating stage. There was going to be eating bitter herbs, unleavened bread, and last of all, the Passover lamb. It is sometimes referred to as the Paschal lamb. And I only give you this so that it would be a new piece of vocabulary for you, the Paschal lamb. This is sometimes the way in which Jewish people refer to it, the Paschal Lamb, or the Pesha. <clears throat> bitter herbs. The bitter herbs are then dipped in the Carol Seth. And then they are handed to each person at the table. So, Keroseth, it is pronounced Keroseth with a hard C-H at the beginning, or Heroset, or Kerosois. Keroseth, now you'll notice that, and I'll highlight it with my cursor, Keroseth speaks. It ends with a TH. And that is because in Hebrew, the correct pronunciation of a tau that is not initial is a soft pronunciation or a TH pronunciation. However, as the years went by, and as Jewish people forsook the ancient pronunciation, they drop the H and then they just pronounce it as a hard T. Carol set. Carol set. And in some cases, Caroy sees, like Moses. Carol set 
is a sweet dark color paste made of fruits and nuts that are eaten at the Passover setter. Its color and texture are meant to recall mortar or mud that's used to make adobe bricks, which the Israelites used when they were enslaved in ancient Egypt. The word keroset comes from the Hebrew word keres, which means clay. On the left, you can see the keroset over here. And you can see my cursor floating over the top. Carol set. This was the sop, which in answer to John's inquiry about the betrayer, and the Lord gave to Judas the sop. John 13, 21 through 30. Matthew 26, 21 and following, Mark 14, 18 and following. If you would be so kind as to turn to the book of John, and we will take a look at chapter 13 and verses 21 through 30. <clears throat> John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26, Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the the morsel and give it to him. And let me rephrase, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel. That is the one for whom I will dip the bitter herbs in the caroset. For when he had dipped the morsel, and the word morsel is this word caroset, I'll explain this to you in just a minute because there is no real good word for morsel, and there is no real good word for slop. He took and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas was had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things that we need for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, that is the, the uh, bitter herbs, that were dipped in the caroset, he went out immediately, and it was night. Please take note of the fact that after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. <clears throat> the word psomion, psomion is a diminutive of somos, which is a morsel. It is a common Koine Greek word. It comes from the verb which means to rub or to crumble. So you either rub something or you crumble something when you take it. Homer uses it to describe the cyclops. And uh, I was thinking that I should get uh, a picture of the cyclops, but I had so much trouble getting a picture of a cyclops the last time that I mentioned him that I decided not to do it. Besides, Hollywood didn't do that good of a job. So this is what Homer says. Then from his mouth 
came bits, that is the word psomos, but it's in the plural psomoi, of human flesh mingled with wine. It's found in the Odyssey, book 9, page 374. The Torah, however, never mentions kereset at all nor is there a blessing for it in the Haggadah. Yet its connection to Passover is ancient. And what I want to say here is that even though the Torah, written by Moses, does not mention it, it goes all the way back to the very beginning, the first of the Passover suppers. Now, while I am talking about the first of the Passover suppers, let me say that there was a distinction made between the first Passover supper, which was had in Egypt, and all subsequent Passovers, which began in the desert and then were had in the land of Israel. In the first Passover supper, the people were supposed to eat the food standing up with their feet uh, shod, they would have, they're supposed to have their sandals on, they're supposed to have their coats on, they're supposed to have their backpacks on, they're supposed to have a staff in their hand, because when they hear the trumpet blowing, they're supposed to go out the door and leave. But subsequent to that, they were supposed to eat the Passover supper laying down or sitting down. And the, the reason for this is that servants, slaves, eat standing up. Free men, free people, eat sitting down. And Christ has made us free. Christ has made us free. All right, the second thing that that falls under the category of the second cup, the unleavened bread, the unleavened bread. Rabbinical authorities, that is the writings of the rabbis, uh, the writings of the rabbis are an awful lot like the commentaries that we have today. Uh, one of the commentaries that we use uh, to a great extent are the nutshell notes the categorical notebooks. And we say, well, uh, nutshell notes are Bob's notes. Uh, categorical notebook is uh, Ralph's notes. And these are basically uh, sermon notes that are collected over the years and they're put in some kind of an order. Well, Bob and Ralph are not the only ones who have done this. For centuries, rabbis have put together their own categorical notebooks and so these rabbinical authorities distinctly state that this Thanksgiving prayer was to follow, not to precede the breaking of the bread. Because it was the bread of poverty and the poor have not whole pita breads, but just broken ones. They have broken pieces. So, rabbinical authorities through the centuries insisted that this prayer was to follow and not precede. Let me highlight that so that you can keep track of it. And this is where the Lord's Supper is distinguished from the last Passover Supper. This distinction is important since the Lord is instituting his own supper here. And according to the unanimous testimony of the Synoptic Gospels and that of the Apostle Paul. Let me quote Matthew 26, 26 says, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it. Okay, this is contrary to the rabbinical authorities. After a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. This 
is where we now have a divergence. The Passover supper is left behind. The communion table is now going to take place. Why do we eat the bread first? Because of this. Then we take the cup. Judas Iscariot, Iscariot left the supper right before this. He did not participate in eating the unleavened bread or the lamb. He did not participate in the first Lord's table. John 13.30. Since our Bibles are open to the uh, New Testament, would you please take a look at verse 30? And this is what it says. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. Remember I said, underline that. And it was night. John 13.30. And then last of all, the Passover lamb itself was eaten. After that, nothing more was to be eaten. So that the flesh of the Passover lamb or the Passover sacrifice might be the last meat partaken. This ends the second cup. So the second cup ends at this point. Now, since the cessation of the Paschal sacrifice, okay, what do I mean by that? Now, you know that the temple was destroyed, and so no sacrifices were then had. So what are the Jewish people supposed to do now? Since the stopping of the Paschal sacrifice, the Jews conclude the supper with a piece of unleavened cake, which they call the afikomen, or the after dish. Then again, they wash their hands to show the ending of the second cup. The third cup, and this is the Lord's Supper. The communion table has superseded the Last Supper. Let me repeat, the Lord's Supper, that is the communion table, has superseded the Last Supper. There are some of you who think that there is something holy about going to see a demonstration of the Passover Supper. And then when you come out of a service like that, you feel holy and you feel uh, lifted up or something. Let me tell you something. What you have, maybe you have it once a month in your local church, is much more precious than the Passover Supper. The Lord Jesus Christ discarded the Passover Supper and instituted his own supper, the communion table. That is a very important little fact for you to remember. Now, I love going to see a demonstration of the Passover supper. I have sat enthralled. My attention is completely focused on what the demonstrator is showing, and I have seen it with the best. But even when Arnold does this, and those of you who know who I'm talking about will know, even when Arnold is doing this, you must remember that the table of the Lord supersedes the Passover supper. Jesus Christ drank the first two cups in the traditional way, Matthew 26, 26. Would you please turn in your Bibles to Matthew, please? And let's take a look at chapter 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26. We actually need to see uh, verses 26 through 29, but let's just take a look at verse 26. The Lord Jesus Christ drank the first two cups in the traditional way. At the third cup, the cup of redemption, he said, this is my blood. Would you please take a look at verses 27 and 28? Well, let me begin at verse 26. 
While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Please take note of the fact that in this passage of Scripture, we are now instituting something new. In fact, we call it an ordinance in Christian theology. There are two ordinances for the church age. One is the Lord's table. The other is water baptism. Both of them picture the position that we have in Christ. So at the third cup, and this is this one, and we see this in verses 27 and 28, this is my blood, verse 27, or verse 28, this is my blood of the covenant, verse 28. Jesus told his disciples that he would not drink the fourth cup, that is the cup of restoration, but promised to do so with him in the coming kingdom. We find this in verse 29. But I say to you, verse 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And this is why the Lord's table also forecasts the coming of the Lord. You doth show forth his death and his appearing to us again. Okay, this is the third cup. And once again, let me repeat. The Lord's Supper, the communion table, has superseded the last Passover Supper. The third cup is called the Cup of Blessing. The third cup is poured after the lamb is eaten. And this was the time when the traditional prayer known as blessing after or blessings after meals uh, or grace after meals, according to one of the uh, rabbinic or the Talmudic tractates, 51 and 1, Barakah, or we could pronounce it Barakah, 51-1. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11.25 The third cup takes special significance in that it gets up close and personal when we take a look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7, where the Lord Jesus is called our Passover. And that is what it says. And with that, our time is up for now. And we will have to continue this study next uh, Thursday when we are together once again. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And we hope to see you next Tuesday, next Thursday, and of course, on for Sunday services.